Hello, thanks for tuning in on uh, January 27th is when I am now and where I am is at home in my office as usual. Um, someone recently, a young woman asked me to comment on a group of online spiritual teachers, let's just call them that, um, psychics of sorts uh, that have influenced someone she knows and, and she's worried about that person because they seem to have gone down a rabbit hole and begun to cut off family and uh, totally involved in this world of um, the other side, so to speak, or um, the Galactic Federation or out-of-body experience or uh, anyway, it's something which isn't this reality because this reality by this group of people, and there's probably thousands of them online right now, that claim that this is kind of like a matrix. It's a construct. It's a uh, simulacra, you know, similar to uh, what Philip K. Dick wrote about many decades ago, a good novel, fun to read, called The Simulacra, and uh, of a futuristic government run by an android. Um, anyway, uh, so these ideas have been around a long time. That's the only reason I brought up Dick. He, he, he titillated his uh, audience with these ideas. So, so let's get back to what I want to talk about here. And, and uh, let's take a peek at, at four of the people. Um, here they are. So anyway, they talk about our simulation is ending. We created the simulation and uh, so forth. But but they had an event uh, not too long ago, the four of them. And I'll read what it says here. Uh, another organization called Olithics um, presented this. And it says, uh, are you ready to explore the true nature of our reality and gain a deeper understanding of the world we live in. Olithics presents an online event featuring four remarkable speakers, Lisa M. Harrison, Alicia Brache, Darius J. Wright, and some lady that just calls herself Athena. I'm not sure if the goddess approves, but let's go on. Lisa M. Harrison brings over a decade of experience interviewing individuals on spirituality, politics, and secret history, and her insights have led her to a greater understanding of the holographic virtual reality we live in, you know, like the simulacra of Philip K. Dick, right? Uh, the matrix. She calls it the holographic reality here. Uh, Alicia Brache has dedicated her life and her soul's path and works with people who retrieve soul memory and heal traumas through the multidimensional field. If you understand that, call me up and explain it to me, but um, uh, I have some idea what it means, but I'm not sure that the person writing it knows what it means. And then Darius J. Wright has been awake, in quotes, to the nature of reality since he was a child and has experienced things that others around him didn't. Uh, so he was special, he was different, he was a bit of a rebel, according to his own uh, testimony. Uh, Athena is an intuitive empath, a seer, and an explorer of multidimensional timelines. So in other words, we can go back and forth in time. Uh, there are many dimensions in the multiverse, uh, multi-universes, whatever. And uh, she's one of those people that has a special power, like a superhero that can take us back and forth, in and out, up and down uh, in that territory. Uh, that's what I'm hearing here anyway, multi-dimensional timelines. So this event, uh, our expert speakers delve into the nature of our reality, what is happening to the world today, and how we can navigate and support ourselves through these times of change. All right, so all of these people claim that, that we're going through a great awakening. Some people are being called to this. Uh, people are confused. Uh, the world is gonna change. You know, this kind of talk has been around what we call the New Age movement. They call it the New Age because of that. It's like a movement in our lifetime, whether you were born in 1800, 1900, 2000, whatever. Um, but it's going to happen real soon, you know, within the lifetime of the speaker. 
and uh, we have to be ready, you know. So you hear dates like 2025, uh, uh, 2047 uh, from people who are living today. And you heard this sort of talk back in, uh, you know, the, the turn of the century where it was going to happen in around the time of World War One, for instance, the great change. So we keep waiting for this to happen. And uh, the end of the world is predicted over and over and over again by cults and Christian sects and people that read the book of Revelation or whatever. Okay, so what's going on here in times of change, I don't know any time that wasn't a time of change, whether in my life or in history. So they're really not telling us anything, these times of change. What the hell is that? It's like President Clinton running on, we need a change. You know, that was a big theme in his, uh, in his uh, campaign. Change what? What are you talking about? Anyway, uh, so I looked into some of these people uh, from, for this client of mine that was concerned about her friend and listened to some of the podcasts. I mean, it takes hours of time. Uh, sometimes I listen while I was driving in a car, but I got some idea of what's going on here. Uh, they, uh, for instance, uh, this guy Darius Wright believes that he can step out of his body at will. Uh, the, the, the clinical term for that is dissociate. You know, some people have this disorder. They dissociate rather easily. Every time they're under stress, they're out of their body, you know. And, uh, and, and he claims he can teach this for $300. You can get into a uh, workshop on one of his uh, websites or his website. And uh, who knows what he teaches there, but I have some idea what that is from all my experience in this field. I mean, what he's doing is nothing new. Uh, some form of auto suggestion, which most of this is. But let me look at a bigger picture of this. Uh, there's this idea throughout occult uh, history, a culture history, that there's this hidden realm, an imperium, uh, that, that only certain people can break into and, and uh, uh, like Prometheus stealing fire from the gods and survive going there, not go insane into that other side, and then bring that knowledge back to us like a shaman or a, a seer or someone in Plato's myth of the cave, you know, goes to the light and tries to teach people who are in the darkness what he saw. And of course, they don't believe him. They say, no, the reality is what we see down here in this reality. And of course, this reality is the construct. And uh, people like Harrison and Brache and Wright and Athena, you know, are kind of the cutting edge uh, teachers who are going to uh, expose the unreality here and help us to see that this isn't what it is. This isn't who we are. Who we are is that eternal soul, that monad, that operating Thetan, as L. Ron Hubbard said, on the other side, that is going to live forever and, and be um, forever happy and, uh, you know, can traverse the realities at will uh, and, and whatever. So, I uh, picked up a book recently, uh, this guy, Miguel Serrano, a writer, a mystic of sorts. Uh, he writes about his interviews with C.G. Jung and Herman Hesse. Now, Jung and Hesse, back in my day, in the hippie days, and probably long before that because they were earlier, uh, were the go-to people among many others, like Carlos Castaneda, if you wanted to be spiritual and not religious, right? So this whole crowd of people that believe they're very special, they're spiritual, as opposed to all those churchianity people that, that are stuck in uh, the matrix and uh, don't really get what religion is supposed to be all about until they listen to somebody like, like them and go to their workshops and, and become enlightened. So in this book, there's two pages I'd like to refer to. In his uh, meetings with uh, Herman Hess, this author says uh, when he when he first met him because Hess invited him into his house and he lived remotely and was quite uh, secretive and didn't have many uh, guests at that time in his later life but he let this guy in Serrano and uh, he says how is it that I have come from so far away and have had the luck to find myself here with you today Serrano asks the elder Hess so Hess is sitting there very quietly, meditatively, uh, Buddha-like, and he says, uh, Hess remained still, bathed in the winter light, and then he spoke, 
Nothing ever happens by chance, he said. Here only the right guests meet. This is the hermetic circle, unquote. Okay, hermetic circle. All right, we'll get to what that is. Hermes, the god Hermes, the god of knowledge in ancient Egypt. Um, uh, the uh, the hermetic tablets. Uh, you know, all of this stuff has been passed down to us in the art culture as being somehow a secret knowledge that only certain people can can learn. So later in his interviews here with C.G. Jung, um, he says that why was it that Jung wrote this preface for me? So he wrote a book of poetry and Jung wrote a preface, which is unusual for Jung to do because he was a very busy man and very prominent uh, uh, person in this world of spiritual seeking. And um, so he says, what was it an example of synchronicity? Again, synchronicity is a Jungian idea that things don't happen by chance and that meaningful coincidences can happen to all of us and that somehow the the hand of the universe is involved in that, that your fate and karma bring you together and, and whatever, you know, so it can't be just a coincidence that we find meaning in. It's got to be bigger than that, you know. So was this an example of synchronicity or was it in response to an impulse of the hermetic circle? Here we go again. The Arya Catena, which has no age, you know, so this is like, um, a circle of uh, friends, a, a mystical brotherhood, a great white brotherhood, ascended masters, the Galactic Federation. I mean, we have endless names for this stuff uh, that we fantasize about. The angels in heaven, for instance, uh, the guardian angels might be one way that uh, Catholics look at it, for instance. But look at another book, another source. This came out over 200 years ago, at least the, what it's talking about. Uh, Carl von Eckartshausen. Uh, he wrote these six letters, mystical letters, around 1803. He lived until 1813. Uh, he had been a Catholic. He then became a mystic and began reading what then was considered theosophy, the works of Jacob Boma and uh, like other pietists in, in the tradition. And he joined the Freemasons for a while. And he, uh, at the end of his life, began to try to fit this stuff all back into his Catholicism. And he wrote these six letters explaining all this. Um, these letters were taken up by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn around 1900, and they were translated, and they're the ones that put this book out called The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary, which is the title of these six letters. The sanctuary meaning, meaning this inner sanctum of beings and energies and truth, which we can't access because there's this cloud of, of mystery around it, a veil, so to speak, um, uh, that won't let us in the temple unless we are initiated and, and we have certain experiences and, and all that. So uh, his writings were revived by the um, uh, Golden Dawn people, and, and this is a translation, and there's a lot of other stuff in here. But let me get to, um, in letter three, he says something which is really interesting. He says, we assure you, we, now he's speaking for the inner sanctum, this, this sanctuary of beings, the, you know, the, the, the critters that channelers tap, tap into, the Ramthas, the Celestes, the, the Morias, the, you know, all of those kind of people. Um, we, we assure you faithfully that we know exactly the innermost of religion and of the holy mysteries, that we possess the absolute certainty and all that has been surmised to be in the adytum, A-D-Y-T-U-M. It's like an inner sanctum. It's like this temple, this, this spiritual place. Um, and that this same possession gives us the strength to justify our commission, imparting to you the dead letter and hieroglyphics everywhere, both spirit and life. And then below that, uh, he goes on to write, we possess a fire which feeds us, which gives us the power to act upon everything in nature. We possess a key to open the gate of mystery and a key to shut nature's lab laboratory. All right, so now I'm reminded of fire, fire yoga, Agni yoga. I'd studied it for seven years. It was brought to us by Nicholas and Helena Rorich back around 1920. There's still Agni Yoga societies around. There are perhaps 3 million people that subscribe to Agni Yoga in Russia alone. 
Uh, it's one of the largest theosophical movements in the world, but little known in the West. Um, and anyway, I had read all their books and studied and believed in it for a little bit of time back in the late 1970s and uh, early 80s. Uh, but so this fire, Agni, the great god of fire, um, one of the primal gods of India, Agni also represents psychic wisdom, that inner self that, that pierces the veils of mystery, you know, to get into this uh, sanctuary that this guy talks about. Of course, we have no photographs of him, but there were paintings of him. And here's a, a way that Carl von Eckharthausen looked to get some idea, you know, back in his day. Very stylish. That's how they dressed. And, uh, you know, I read the letters and, you know, I was underwhelmed. Uh, they're not very instructive. There's a lot of repetition, which is typical of occultists. They're constantly repeating the same things, like you hear them repeat cliches about the construct and, and the matrix, and, and who knows if they know what they're talking about. Probably not. But what, what I'd like to bring up here to finish this is something out of Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum, and he takes us through a fictional romp through the art culture. It's one of the neatest books I've read on this whole territory. One of the key characters in this is a guy named Saint Germain. He really lived at one time, but he's a character in this book, and it's more up in modern times. And so there's these people um, in the book, the protagonists, they're caught up in a kind of a conspiracy, like on the other side, that, that this other world is invading this world, and there's all these mysteries happening, and they totally get caught up in it. And one of them says because he's an editor and he knows what happens when you write things uh, like books. He says, um, but the moment you pick up the clay, electronic or otherwise, so the moment you start espousing this stuff, writing it down, doing your podcasts, inviting people to your workshops online or whatever, um, you will become a demiurge. Now, a demiurge is Greek for the creator, the logos, the thing that put this whole universe, this conspiracy, this matrix together and is fooling us, you know, that, that, that keeps us trapped. Our individual sparks of light are trapped in these flesh bodies that are mechanized by this God, this demiurge, for his own pleasure, you know, and uh, and he can toy with us and whatever until we break through and, and, and uh, realize what's going on. Like our friends here that, that I just talked about, Lisa M. Harrison and company, uh, to give us a peek into what's really going on, right? So then we become a demiurge as soon as we begin to do this. So we become just like that God. We create another matrix, which is exactly what I see all of these channelers and people doing, these psychics that claim to have out-of-body experiences that go to the other side, see reality as it is, you know, with certainty, just like uh, this character Carl did. And, um, and then they start creating this world. So anyway, I'll finish this. You become a demiurge. And he who embarks on the creation of worlds is already tainted with corruption and evil. So what's he saying? Listen, we're flawed beings. Whatever we come up with always needs adjustment, always needs improvement. And we do better when we reality test it. This is one of the things in psych hospitals that you have to help people adjust to when they're in treatment is reality testing. How do you test reality? Um, because it's going to help you get along in life and get along with other people and, and all of that. You're not going to be in, living in some special schizophrenic silo with only a few people believing in you, maybe a few thousand, uh, but you have a better grasp on reality, a better handle on life, and uh, you'll have a happier time of it, you know, is the idea behind that. But if you're going to go to this other side and think that you're escaping the demiurge by going into the little demiurge, you know, the, the Lisa M. Harrison's little world or Darius's little world or Athena's little world, another creation uh, about what the world is really about. Uh, now you've shrunk your reality down. Now you've gone into what they say is hyper reality or like Rudolf Steiner said, is a super sensible world. But it's actually, you know, in my view, a world that's more constricted. 
you're going to feel more close claustrophobic after time because it continues to repeat itself and all the so-called powers that you thought you were going to get, you don't get. And then you find out when you get close to the leader that they don't have it either. You know, they're kind of faking it. And, uh, and you might spend a few thousand dollars before you find that out. You might spend 10, 15 years before you find that out. Well, it's better if you do a little research and before you get into the great work of finding yourself and the true self out of this matrix, um, uh, do some work in this world and, and flip this whole thing around. Instead of exploring the nature of reality, look at the reality of nature. That's where you're going to begin to become healthy again and to interact with your environment in a proper way like animals do. They don't question all this stuff. They just go through life. They're doing what they have to do. A lion does what a lion does, a bee what a bee does. Human beings muddle this all up and we create these other worlds, our mythologies, our religions, our, our, our uh, ideas of a matrix. That's another idea. And then we create another matrix, you know, uh, based on, you know, some channel, like let's say Ramtha has her own matrix to get out of the matrix, and now you're in a smaller matrix, <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's endless, and, and you never really get to solve the problem because you're back down in these rabbit holes. It's really easy to get into this online. You pay a few hundred bucks, or you know, you subscribe to something for fifty dollars a, a month or whatever, and you invested in it. So you want to keep going, thinking you're on a mission to find uh, things. Uh, you might have some insights along the way, but in the long run. It's a rabbit hole, and I recommend you stay away from all of that and, uh, you know, read something a little more entertaining and enlightening like Umberto Eco's Foucault's Pendulum. I read it three times. You know, I've annotated it. Like you can see all these notes, and I've written papers on it. I, I, I reviewed it. Um, but don't start dreaming like this guy did over 200 years ago that there's some sanctuary that's clouded and then if you read his letters you're going to pierce through that and if you follow his directions you're going to become one of them one of the elite one of the masters one of the uh, uh, people that ascended and has come into reality as it is um, again uh, it's not about the nature of reality it's about the reality of nature so I'll leave it at that and thank you for listening and I uh, hope to see you again.